Okay, uh, thank you, Pierre and the, the organizers for having uh, invited me. Uh, this is a, a sort of challenge for me today uh, because uh, I will talk to um, computer scientists and, uh, and discrete mathematicians. I don't know if the, this is the correct uh, terminology, but um, I, will, I will talk about uh, very different things uh, a priori to, to what you you expect to, to, to discover during this, this week. Um, so the title is, uh, is about uh, ecological transition and the Anthropocene. So I can uh, first give a, a definition of Anthropocene very briefly. This is mostly debated uh, in, the, in, the in the scientific community, but this is the idea that uh, humanity has uh, now a, a, a huge force uh, that acts onto the, the earth, the climate, but not only the biodiversity, a lot of things, and that it can be perceived um, scientifically and even personally. And it can have dramatic uh, influences that I will explain a little bit. Um, yeah, and to explain a, a, a bit more about those different logos, so ex Marseille University, um, INT, this is a, uh, the Institute of Neuroscience of Latimon, um, where I am, and three uh, logos here about uh, eco-responsibility, uh, Atecopol, this is Atelier Ecology Politique uh, at Aix Marseille, and Scientific uh, in Rebellion. I will, uh, I will explain those logos during the, the, the presentation. Um, yeah, and just to start, uh, to explain you a bit more about my uh, classical trajectory, academic trajectory, uh, in order you to understand uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, several things. So I, I've, um, I've had a master in applied mathematics, then a, a PhD in signal and image processing in 2007, and it was in a neuroscience lab. Uh, next, I've been uh, hired as an assistant prof in, in computer science in, uh, in Marseille in 2009. And I moved to uh, a neuroscience lab uh, five years ago. Uh, and very briefly, my uh, classical uh, fields of research are about um, modeling and uh, understanding some aspects about the, the shape of the brain with uh, clinical applications. But I, I'm also interested in a more fundamental uh, research, more theoretical research, uh, for instance, regarding spectral analysis of graphs and, and surfaces. And just, oops, sorry, um, a few uh, illustrations just to, for you to have an idea. So I'm, I'm studying this very uh, interesting shape here, so three different brains with different uh, structures here, the, 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 the cortical folding. Uh, cortical folds, and I, I study that with MRIs, MRI images here. Uh, it's possible to reconstruct uh, 3D models of, uh, of the brain by using those images and try to uh, analyze those, uh, those shapes with different tools. And uh, I have also, um, uh, let's say, more modeling uh, parts in my research uh, regarding the simulation of the, uh, the emergence of the folds here during the, the gestation. Okay, so this is, a, you can see it as a sort of dynamical system. There is a, a dynamic, an evolution of a surface uh, that is smooth at the beginning and that uh, is able to, to create some, uh, some, some shapes. Uh, in this part, I'm, um, in the, I'm more in the, the validation of the model. I'm not an expert in uh, uh, biomechanical uh, simulation. I try to uh, find good ways to uh, check that the model is correct. And this is not a, an easy task. And uh, also I mentioned uh, this uh, very uh, uh, inspiring paper by Alan Turing, the last paper he, he published before, uh, before his death. So the chemical basis of morphogenesis, it's a, it's a large source of inspiration, in particular because it's not present in that sort of model. All the, uh, let's say, the genetic aspects, um, that are uh, necessary in the morphogenesis. So morphogenesis is not only a question of growth and mechanics, of course. And uh, yeah, it's something that we can try to incorporate to the models. And uh, to my opinion, it's, 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 very, uh, it's a very motivating uh, topic. But 
Um, six years ago, approximately, seven, um, I've had a, a satori, let's say, a beautiful uh, Japanese word, um, just to, um, to tell that uh, I've realized something very strong. I was walking uh, in the Alps, so close to Chamonix. Uh, if you know this, uh, this city, uh, you can take a train and go to a glacier uh, called uh, Mer de Glace. And uh, you can walk, uh, you can go down uh, to the glacier. And um, when you go down, there are some indications here of the level of glacier um, during the past years. So it's, here it was in 2003. The glacier is here, so uh, probably hmm, 20 meters uh, uh, downstairs uh, below. And uh, it, it is a, a strong uh, personal experience of what is climate change, actually. Uh, because I, I really realized during this moment uh, what impact it, it could have. It, it was not only a question of graphics, of uh, curves, trends, uh, things like this. This is a, a strong uh, personal experience. And as you can imagine, uh, the consequence uh, oops, is uh, a state quite well described by this painting by Edvard Munch. Um, a sort of um, a complicated state, uh, mental state, to uh, continue to do uh, uh, his own research. Um, so uh, after that, really, it has been a, a change in my, uh, uh, in the way I, I considered science and how I could play a role in, the, in this um, ecological crisis. Uh, and I will explain you after several attempts I have done to um, try to redirect my uh, trajectory. Not, this is not a full redirection, so I'm still working on the, the, the topics I presented you, to you before, so about uh, brain development, but uh, I try to, uh, to do other things. And uh, this is a first one of the first things um, I've done or I've discovered here. I, I was one among the, uh, the 15,000 scientists who signed this paper. Uh, this is a warning to humanity uh, and a warning regarding a lot of trends. So I, I selected uh, just four trends here. Uh, the first one is the uh, amount of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. So uh, this is a, a constant increase. Uh, uh, in the in the 60 uh, in the past 60 years, and uh, there is a link with the increase of temperature uh, in the same period. So here, this is you recognize the the, the, the issue of uh, the problem of climate change, and this is not the only problem. There is also this question of uh, biodiversity loss. So here, this is the decrease of um, uh, vertebrate uh, abundance. There are also uh, problems with uh, resources such as uh, fresh water here. So all the, the trends are, are really uh, hard when you discover uh, them because it, the, the, the idea that comes is that the, the, the future of humanity is really, uh, is really uh, in danger. Um, so this was my uh, state of mind uh, in 2017 or 18. Um, I don't know if it's necessary to, to explain more about that. Um, maybe, yeah, I discovered those curves. Probably you, you know them. Um, how to be convinced by this uh, climate change. So I don't think now this is a, a problem, but maybe six years ago, 10 years ago, there was a lot of uh, skepticism about this scientific fact. Uh, so there are curves, so correlation here uh, between CO2 and temperature. Here this is the level of CO2 now. There are also models here that try to, uh, to, to convince that the anthropogenic um, forces, so the, the contribution of human activity, is the only determinant of climate change. So this, those two simulations here, so on the right, uh, uh, 
you have black, the black curve here that represents the, the observation of the temperature. So you can see an increase. And in, in red and blue, uh, there are um, two, uh, two kind of simulations uh, that don't take into account the human activity. So when you do that, when you take only into account, for instance, the variations of, uh, of the, 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 the energy um, brought by the sun, things like this, uh, the model predicts uh, no evolution of the temperature. But if you add the anthropogenic component, you can see that the model is, 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 is quite uh, realistic, or realistic. So for the uh, IPCC members, so the, the, the members of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, in GIEC in, in French, uh, it has, um, it has led to a scientific cons consensus, and now uh, we, can, we, can, we can really say that climate change is a scientific fact, and no one can contest that uh, the anthropogenic um, cause is the, the only determinant. So for instance, this paper here is a meta-analysis on uh, a large number of, uh, of articles to show that there, there, there is no more, uh, there are no more debates on this uh, on this question. Okay, so once we we have said that, um, what's next? So the IPCC proposes some scenarios to uh, to limit the uh, the increase of temperature. Uh, and for that, you need to control the amount of CO2 that uh, the human activity will send in the atmosphere. So in this graphic, uh, zero is the objective you want to reach. Okay, so zero is the um, difference between what humanity sends into the atmosphere minus what is um, taken by the oceans or the forests. Uh, so now there is an excess, clearly. Um, and the trends is increasing, and there are different scenarios. So here, this is the scenario. If you want to reach an increase of 1.5 degrees at the end of the century, uh, here we have the, the business as usual policies. So nothing really changed, uh, or maybe it's optimistic in some sense. The, the CO2 stabilizes, but the implication of that is an increase of temperature of three degrees, at least three degrees, uh, at uh, au moins trois degrés. And um, as you can imagine, I have no time to detail here uh, the consequences uh, precisely, uh, and it's a bit uh, 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 frightening. But you can imagine a lot of consequences in terms of level of oceans, okay, in terms of mortality in regions where the temperature is high. The list is very uh, is very uh, large. So uh, the question is: uh, Is it possible to to reach this uh, this trajectory? And of course, in the following, uh, as scientists, as computer scientists, what can we do for that? Um, I will assume in the following that um, because I'm mostly speaking about my my personal case. I assume that I want to contribute to this trajectory, and I don't want to contribute to this one, of course. But it's not just a question of saying things like this. We need also means to do that. Uh, okay, so this is a sort of um, um, uh, interlude, but just to, 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 to tell you that during my uh, trajectory, uh, I rediscovered some, some things that have been done in the 70s, for instance, um, this uh, limits to growth um, uh, book published in 72, if I remember. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but this is, I think it's, it's interesting for, you, for your community. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, here you have a big system, complex systems with uh, a lot of variables in all those, uh, those boxes. For instance, here uh, you have the population here. And here you have a lot of variables that control the population, for instance, mortality rate, uh, natality rate, things like this. 
you have also other uh, components like pollution, uh, agriculture, uh, use of lands, uh, a, a large box for economical aspects, and you have interactions between all those boxes. And this is a, this is a dynamical system, a continuous dynamical system. So uh, as soon as you have a, a link between two boxes, you have a, a, a differential equation. And uh, people in the 70s, like uh, Denis and Donella Meadows and uh, the others, uh, tried to simulate the state of the world based on a complete description of, uh, let's say, uh, 100 variables, so, such as the one I presented. And they were able to calibrate their models, so based on, uh, on values uh, before, I don't know, uh, the, the, 70, the 70s. And they were able to, to make predictions. For instance, here this is the, the population, the pollution, uh, the evolution of resources. Um, and uh, yeah, depending on, for instance, whether you uh, have policies to stabilize population or to regulate pollution, you can have different trajectories. Okay, uh, from a mathematical point of view, it's, it's quite frightening to imagine this sort of system and to be sure that the prediction uh, would be correct. But uh, there is a community today that tries to uh, revisit that sort of models and they show uh, quite, uh, quite interesting results. And okay, so it's just to, to, to show you that because um, during a, a short period, I was tempted to go to this, uh, to this community. I did not. Uh, in the 70s, there is also uh, uh, something to rediscover. I think it's worth uh, being uh, rediscovered. I don't know if you recognize this guy. Yeah, I, I've heard the name. So it's uh, Alexandre Grotendik. And um, in, uh, in 72, uh, he, he had this famous uh, conference uh, in CERN, uh, the, the, the big uh, uh, physics center in, uh, in Genève or Lausanne, I don't remember. Um, and uh, the title of the conference, oops, the title of the conference was, uh, are we going to continue um, scientific research? Uh, yeah. And uh, the text is available, uh, sorry it's in French, but I will summarize it uh, very uh, rapidly. Um, there is this first idea at the beginning of the text that uh, uh, the research, the, 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 the edge research, let's say, uh, is associated to, uh, to a, a real threat to humanity, okay? And it's not mentioned here, but of course, he's thinking about uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, this was a major problem in the, in the 70s, but also other aspects such as pollution, um, societal aspects. And uh, so he starts with that, and he, he really points the, the, the question of what is the place of science in this um, situation. And he continues with uh, a question that is very interesting for me. Uh, why are we doing scientific research? Uh, this is uh, something he, he points because he says that nobody uh, discusses this question. Seriously. Uh, in general, we can discuss that because we can find that, uh, I don't know, uh, this field of research in mass is, uh, is stimulating because it's, it's beautiful. It's, uh, we have <coughs> some personal desire to do that. It, it brings us a lot of, uh, of joy, things like this. But in terms of um, how we are embedded in the, in the, in the, uh, in the world, it, it's not really addressed. So he continues with the question of uh, continuing or stopping uh, scientific research. And he, he gives an answer at the, at the end uh, of the text, which is, uh, I, I will say, uh, uh, right now, for me, it's too, too radical. But he says, um, he says that it's not necessary to, uh, to have more knowledge, and we have to change our civilization. Okay. And there is something a bit problematic in that for me. This is the, 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 this anti-science idea. So for Grotendieck, as I understand here, it's no more necessary to do science because science is in some sense intrinsically bad. And uh, when I read this text at, uh, during, the, the, during my satori, let's say, I was, uh, I was really impressed by that and I, 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 I adhered to this, to this uh, discourse. 
But now I think it's it's not um, it's not something that is possible to uh, to to follow. So I will propose other uh, options that uh, than um, <laughs> going into the into a, a forest or and living alone or things like this because I, I don't think it's uh, something desirable. Um, so it's hard to imagine this sort of post-industrial and anti-science uh, civilization, and I would like to, yeah, to, to start with several questions. I, I won't address them all, but uh, there is this question of, of scales when you want to, to, to go to action, so to do something in this context of uh, ecological crisis. There is this big question of uh, what can we do uh, as scientists, not as citizens, but as scientists. Uh, there are also uh, extra questions like this, not scientific questions, but really uh, important because uh, scientists have a role to play in the dans la cité, uh, in the Greek uh, uh, sense, okay, uh, in the organization of the, 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 the civilization, let's say, and how uh, what, what are the implications of that? Um, okay, so this is um, just, I, I will be very brief on that. Uh, this is a chronology to show you uh, several uh, initiatives uh, in the scientific community. I will just point this one, a French initiative, Labo 1.5. Um, this is about uh, yeah, several uh, thousands of scientists in, in France who decided to decrease the environmental impact of research. Uh, you can think of, uh, for instance, traveling. Uh, when you travel by plane, you emit a lot of CO2. Uh, if you work in a field of research with uh, large equipment, uh, it emits a lot of CO2 of greenhouse gas emissions to build uh, the equipment, to make the equipment work, things like this. Uh, it's, it's, so it's a very uh, popular initiative, and now this is well recognized by our institution. This is really fascinating because in, in 2019, uh, it was not the case. And there, there has been more, uh, less classical uh, actions, let's say, here. Uh, the, the civil disobedience, I will speak about that later. Just to point that uh, two recent events, uh, here scientists, French scientists um, have had a trial uh, because they stayed in the Museum Histoire Naturelle in Paris uh, after the closing of the museum and they, they were just here to, uh, to tell the truth uh, because it's not a crime and tell the truth it's uh, there is a global warming we have to do something or politics have to do something because they don't do anything at the moment and they, they won the trial uh, good, uh, good news. But uh, in USA, for instance, the geologist uh, Rosa Abramov uh, has been fired from her lab because she protested during a congress uh, just to uh, say similar, uh, similar messages. Okay? So uh, civil disobedience is an option for, for scientists. Uh, this is the first uh, answer I can propose to you if you want. So I have to say that personally I've been uh, engage in some of those uh, actions. Um, so here this is, uh, uh, let's say, the, the, the most radical actions that scientists have, uh, have done uh, recently in, uh, in München. They have glued their hands uh, on, onto this car and um, uh, to, uh, to warn about, uh, about climate change. Uh, they have been put in jail for one week um, and they are uh, the try, their trial is, uh, is, is, um, is, is happening now. And on the right, this is Palais Longchamp in Marseille. So if you want to, to visit the city, uh, this is a very nice place. And there was this message here uh, sent to uh, our, uh, our, uh, our French president, Emmanuel Macron, uh, to, uh, to say uh, um, that uh, he has to stop to lie. Okay. So this is always this question of telling the truth. Okay telling the truth that scientists have, um, have uh, established regarding climate change. Okay, uh, there are less radical options. Uh, there is a plurality of engagement. So uh, we are scientists, we can uh, write texts. For instance, this, uh, uh, this text in the, the French newspaper Le Monde 
uh, about the mega basin. Uh, it was a big issue last year, a uh, big fight uh, between the government and the, the ecological uh, movements uh, because there, there, there were some, some conflicts on how to use the water. Um, and uh, so this was uh, a plaidoyer, so a lot of arguments, scientific arguments to say that uh, megabasins are not a, a reasonable way to manage the water in, the, uh, in France. Uh, another action here against uh, a, bank, a French bank uh, that continues to invest in fossil fuel energies uh, with greenwashing uh, aspects and things like this. Uh, it was not a uh, civil disobedience action here. Yeah, it's more like, uh, let's say, uh, uh, informing the, the public. And uh, yeah, now I'd like to, to point maybe some pros uh, aspects for um, nonviolent civil disobedience. It's a simple solution in some sense um, because the, the targets are, are quite obvious. Uh, if you think of fossil fuel companies, uh, most of them are not engaged in the good trajectory to limit their, um, uh, the extraction of, of oil in the soil. So, um, so they are not sincere, and it's, to my opinion, uh, you can disagree, of course, it's not legitimate, uh, for me, it's legitimate to, uh, to, to consider them as targets. Um, and uh, it's also, yeah, civil disobedience is also more and more accepted in, uh, among the, the, the scientists. In this uh, recent preprint, uh, it was a survey uh, for uh, 10,000 uh, scientists, and half of them were mentioning that uh, they could participate to uh, civil disobedience actions. Air, and uh, it's, it's also a, a topic that is more and more documented in the, in the scientific uh, literature. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting, but of course there are some uh, inconveniences to that. Um, out, outside France, there is a risk, of course, if you, if you think of uh, Rosa Abramov uh, or the colleagues that have been put in jail, uh, it can be a real problem for your career. So uh, I, I think in France we are relatively protected, so that's why, for instance, uh, I'm uh, in some sense uh, engaged in that. Um, but there are also more fundamental aspects regarding uh, to be clear with notions such as neutrality or uh, this one, uh, authority positioning. Because if you, if you go into the public space to say, uh, I'm a scientist, I have the truth, I will explain you how, it, how the world uh, works, uh, I don't think the reaction of the, of the citizens will be uh, always positive. So uh, you need to be very careful with that. And, uh, and this is an argument also that has been used in the, in the other, um, in the, the reverse sense, in this, uh, in this book, Merchants of Doubt, written by two historians, uh, Eric Conway and, uh, um, uh, ah, uh, don't remember her name, um, Naomi Oreskes. Uh, she, they documented uh, all uh, scientists have, have lied about, for instance, uh, tobacco industries, but also climate change, a lot of things like this. They have um, used their scientific positioning to say uh, wrong things about the dangers of tobacco, of uh, climate <coughs> change, and so on. So we need to be careful with this, this scientific positioning. And I'd like to detail a bit more this neutrality question because this is probably a first reflex to say, oh, I'm a scientist, I have nothing to do with the, the public sphere. Or if I do this, it's only as a citizen, okay? I, 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 I change my role. But I'd like to not to defend uh, necessarily uh, this, this civil disobedience based on, um, on the uh, on the, on the notion of neutrality, but I'd like just to, 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 to explain a bit more. So this, this question of neutrality, um, it has to do with the fact that as a researcher, we are included in a, in a large sociological uh, context. For instance, we need money for, for us just to live, uh, for our grants, for our activity, uh, for our community. Uh, and our scientific community is also a very, um, 
sociological objects where there are influences, powers, uh, we have to, to be very uh, aware of that. And when we realize this thing, uh, it's, it's quite complicated to say science is neutral or we have to be more precise in the definition of neutrality. For that, uh, we can introduce the notion of values. So values are in some sense different from facts. But in the values, you have also to distinguish between the epistemic or scientific values and the contextual values. And it helps a lot to, to, to my point of view. For instance, just to give you uh, examples, uh, epistemic values for, for, for science are, for instance, preciseness, uh, simplicity. Uh, here, maybe it's more related to models. When you have a model of the world, you prefer uh, um, a model with um, not a lot of variables. Between two models, you prefer the, the, the smallest one. This is uh, Occam, uh, Occam's razor principle. Uh, you can be also uh, interested in efficiency. This is a value probably this, that is important for, uh, for computer science. But in, both, in all those cases, this is, um, th those are epistemic values. But there are also probably uh, non-epistemic values, equity, uh, justice, tran transparency that are not really fundamental uh, in doing our research, but that can influence a lot uh, our way of doing research. And for instance, uh, I could detail it more later, but efficiency can be uh, maybe in between. Okay? It could be influenced in some sense by uh, uh, contextual uh, um, influences. Um, of course, if you have questions, I can uh, I can stop the the talk. Um, uh, and I will close with this text. This is a text in in, uh, in French. I, I translated it with the with Deep L. Uh, uh, sorry for that. Um, without correcting it, but this is written by uh, the French philosopher Aurélien Berland, uh, who wrote a very clear text about what is scientific neutrality, and he comes back to, um, to this notion introduced by Max Weber, the, the sociologist, uh, more than uh, one century ago. And uh, so, uh, in bold, important aspects, you, have to, you need to be aware of the insidious ways in which our values uh, can bias our view of the world. Uh, the values are important also when you select problems uh, in which you are interested in. Uh, and the last sentence is very important. He mentions that today we, we consider neutrality as granted. So uh, for a lot of scientists, we are neutral. But this uh, prevents something um, that is really important. This is the reflexivity. So, we have to say that neutrality is probably an asymptotic state. It's impossible, infeasible to reach this uh, neutrality. But the, um, the trajectory to reach the neutrality, so being aware of all our biases, are important, um, important to be put on the table to precisely try to reach the neutrality, but also to be uh, aware of all, all dependencies. And this is an important problem in the context of Anthropocene because, uh, as you guess, um, there are influences of several actors, such as companies, such as the state, and so on, and they have an influence on, on our researches and how they will uh, drive our researches. I realize that by saying that, it's more, um, uh, it's more a message that is valid for applied research, but probably it has also uh, a relevance for, for theoretical researchers as, as you. Um, OK, so this is the, the end of the, uh, the, the, the scientist rebellion aspect. I will propose you now the, the second answer, the uh, individual redirection uh, based on my field of activity, so computer science. I'm not, uh, let's say, uh, Computers, fundamental computer scientist, but I, I'm a, a teacher in, in computer science. So this, is, uh, this was the, the first option I, I had. I will show you this after. So when I realized that I could do something through uh, computer science, this is the sort of reaction I had. So uh, the idea is that 
we can use the technology provided by computer science and it could be of great help to solve a lot of uh, ecological problems. Uh, typically, uh, I can try to develop uh, more efficient softwares uh, and, uh, okay, it's perfect. Uh, it will solve a lot of problems. Or probably I, I was aware of this problem uh, that uh, information technologies are not dematerialized. Uh, but this is, a, this is a narrative that has been uh, Really, uh, it's been really used in the in the two in the in the years 2000. And then I met the collective uh, Ecoinfo. This is a group of CNRS, the uh, French uh, uh, Research uh, Institute uh, institution. And this group is uh, about eco responsibility. And um, I discovered some impressive, to my opinion, um, uh, uh, data about uh, the impact of the information and communication technologies in terms of CO2 emissions. So first, there was this report. Um, this, it, it is not an academic report. It has been published in 2018. And the important uh, thing is here. So. Uh, it would represent 4% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions with uh, a trend exponentially uh, growing trend, so a rapid increase of 9% per year. Um, it was a bit embarrassing with this report because it's not academic. Uh, it's, uh, it, was, uh, 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 it was written by this uh, lobby, the shift project. And uh, we had to, to wait 2021 to have a, a, a nice paper here, very long, very detailed, that tried to have a more uh, critic view about the, uh, the uh, impact of ICT in terms of uh, CO2 emissions. The numbers are quite comparable, uh, but they, have, uh, they propose some um, uncertainties on, the, on that. It's not a fixed number. Uh, here. Uh, and some important messages in this uh, report. So they, they documented all the, the studies uh, that have tried to quantify. This is not an easy task, as you can imagine. So try to quantify the impact of the, the devices. So it's not only a question of energy. This is a question of how you build your, your machines, uh, the, the impact of the infrastructure, the cables. Uh, so the impact of data centers, okay, so a lot of different things to take into account. And um, they propose two different uh, narratives. Uh, they say that it exists. There are two different narratives for the, the role of ICT in the, in the climate change. So um, very opposite roles. There is enablement, oops, sorry. Enable, enablement uh, role here where ICT could help uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, okay? And another one where they say we need to be careful to rebound effects. And rebound effects are probably what happened for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 information communication technology in the past years because the progress in terms of efficiency, it's very clear. If you think of the Moore laws, for instance, or the Kumi's law, for instance, with one uh, uh, kilowatt hour of energy, uh, you're able to, uh, to do uh, exponentially uh, uh, faster computations, okay? But in the same time, the impact of ICT has increased. So it's probably uh, the presence of a rebound effect. And in both cases, you have two different uh, policies that are uh, not incompatible, but really different. Here, this is an efficiency policy. So uh, let's say you will try to improve more the technologies. And in the other case, you will mo act more on the, the use of the technology. So this is more the, the societal um, component. And, um, yeah, I could discuss it more, but for instance, the, the, the French government has a very ambiguous uh, discourse about those two notions. Uh, for, for those who have uh, followed this question, sobriety has been a key word very used in the past year. 
But I'm not completely sure that they use sobriety as they should. Probably sobriety for them is more related to efficiency. Sobriety is really the, this idea of having a, a quota, uh, an absolute value of, of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions, and you have not to exceed it. Okay? Uh, efficiency, it's more, uh, uh, I give you uh, a quantity of energy, uh, and how many computations can I do with that? Okay. Um, is it clear? Yeah. Uh, so, so once you discover all those things, you want to teach them. So maybe I can be uh, quite fast. Uh, but we proposed here a paper with colleagues of EcoInfo uh, to, uh, to to describe uh, several um, uh, teaching units we proposed in our uh, universities and. Uh, we also proposed some uh, some difficulties in in trying to uh, to, to develop those uh, those teachings. So the question of legitimacy, uh, how to introduce that sort of teaching in the in the programs, uh, and these very difficult questions: how to go from the knowledge to skills? Uh, because uh, we have students; they will, uh, for, for most of them, work after that in uh, in companies, and all. Uh, will they implement all this knowledge uh, concretely in the, in the companies where, for instance, questions of sobriety uh, are quite uh, difficult to implement because, in general, it contradicts uh, principles such as uh, doing profit and things like this. So it's not an easy task. Um, we proposed in this teaching, uh, ah, yeah, we implemented it here in Marseille with some colleagues, uh, I don't know if Pierre Alain is here. Uh, but uh, with very various perspectives, for instance, uh, trying to um, quantify the energy consumption of, uh, of, of programming, uh, just compare different languages and to try to see uh, what is the, the most efficient. Uh, but we proposed also uh, to, uh, to the students to read uh, articles uh, just to, uh, for them to realize all computer science and information technology are embedded in, their, uh, in, the, in the society. Okay, so there are very uh, various uh, topics. Uh, su surveillance capitalism, uh, bu filter bubbles, uh, things like this. There can be a nice mathematics behind. Uh, and also interesting uh, reflections here about uh, uh, values in computer science, such as efficiency, uh, but also resilience or robustness. Uh, to me, it's, 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 really, um, it's really stimulating here uh, because it, it proposes another approach um, that is less, uh, less classic and uh, that makes things to, let's say, a new paradigm for, for computer science. Of course, it's not completely new. Uh, robustness uh, to, uh, to faults, things like this, is not new. But um, yeah, maybe it's something that could have more, um, have more uh, impact today in a world where resilience is probably something that we, we want to, to develop. Uh, okay, and in the, on the research side, I, uh, I've been interested in the distinction here that exists between the, the positive role of artificial intelligence, so I will precise it just after. Uh, for instance, here on this graphic, uh, you have several um, uh, sustainable development goals, such as defined by the uh, nation, uh, on dit, uh, ONU, an, a nation, uh, Organization for uh, United Nations. Thank you. Uh, so when you look at these pictures, so you have the thing that AI is, is, is more uh, uh, benefit, beneficial than detrimental. But in the same time, there is a tension because you know that for large neural networks, um, it can take a lot of energy to train the models. This is uh, already a quite old uh, uh, article, but in this paper they, they mentioned that if you train a very large model, it can represent the equivalent of 300 of travels between New York and San Francisco in terms of flights, okay? So 300 uh, tons of CO2, approximately. So there is clearly a tension that if you want to uh, uh, deploy massively um, technologies such as AI, because they could be beneficial, you have also to take that into account. And uh, for us, it was really a surprise to, to discover that the narratives around this question uh, don't mention this, this tension. Well, actually, it's not really a surprise. 
but uh, we very rapidly, uh, by inspecting the literature in machine learning and deep learning, we, we, we have seen in approximately 60 articles that positive applications of machine learning, for instance, to, uh, for optimizing transportation, for smart cities, things like that, were completely uh, ignorant of the impact of the technology uh, they proposed. And uh, to us, this is either a bias of techno-optimism uh, or uh, a question of ignorance of what are this, those impacts. So the conclusion is that we have probably to, um, to, to develop uh, more quantification on the impacts of AI. Uh, I can skip that very rapidly. There are methodologies such as life cycle assessment. Uh, you can quantify the impact not only of CO2 here, this is global warming potential. There are also the, the, the use of water, the, the, the toxicity, the use of resources during the, the life cycle of a device or a software. By showing this picture, you can observe that the, a lot of that is unknown. So probably we have to do more uh, to, to understand more about the impacts. But um, at the end, there is this question. If we uh, succeed in, in describing precisely all the impacts of technologies such as AI, at the end, who will decide? Okay, in a perfect world, uh, politics, well informed by scientists and by discussing with citizens, uh, they will, for instance, uh, say, oh, okay, this technology has a positive impact so, or maybe negative, so we won't do it. But is it the case today? I don't think so. There are a lot of examples that show that we have no data, and when we have data, mm, sometimes things uh, uh, are, not, uh, are not positive for the, the environment. Uh, and uh, I'm really uh, too long, no? If, if I want to, to save time for the questions. Or, but um, j I've just started to, to, to investigate more precisely this question of, of AI in the lab, so in my lab, uh, and uh, in the, also in the community uh, of neuroscience labs in, in Marseille with uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan Lemers, an internship, a uh, very uh, uh, brilliant internship, who addressed two types of questions, the, the, the question of impact of AI in terms of quantitative impact, so what I presented before in brief, uh, what's the uh, energy, amount of energy uh, required for AI, but what is also the sociological impact of AI, because precisely in our, in our, in our lab, a lot of researchers have uh, switched from, let's say, old methods to new methods using AI. It's, it's a very uh, rapid change in the practices, in the, in the job practices, and I wanted to understand that. To me, it's really uh, fundamental to understand uh, how the individuals and the community is attached, is linked to, uh, for instance, AI, if next we want to have um, policies regarding, for instance, environmental issues. Because you can, I, I don't believe in, or I don't want authoritarian action that would come from the top and that would say, okay, we have to stop AI in the lab. So. Uh, it, for a lot of aspects, uh, competitivity aspects that are questionable, of course, but it means also a lot of students uh, will have no careers uh, if you say we stop. So the idea I, I really want to, to defend is that we, we need to engage all the community in a democratic uh, way to think uh, about those questions and to decide collectively. And to me, it has to be um, a time uh, included in the research, <coughs> those collective debates. Uh, okay, so I can skip that. Um, Nathan tried several tools to quantify the impact of AI, and even for all those tools, the results can vary a lot, so it's not an easy, uh, an easy task to understand uh, really how it works. So this is my, my conclusion at the, at the moment. And in terms of qualitative study, uh, yeah, we have tried to uh, to, to understand uh, more uh, the, the values of our colleagues uh, through, uh, uh, um, through interviews. Um, 
to understand the narratives regarding uh, the question of AI. So there are three different kinds of narratives, uh, an ecological narrative. So a lot are, are, are aware of uh, the fact that deep learning consumes a lot of energy and that it could be a problem. There are also techno-solutionists. Uh, AI can be necessary for, uh, for health, for instance. In neuroscience, we have a lot of applications for, for clinics. And there, there are also a lot of ethical uh, considerations. Well, no, nothing really new in that, but to me, the, the, the approach is important to, to make it public. Okay. Um, regarding the values, I have no time to detail it more. Uh, I, I should also explain that. And the, the last answer I would like to present to, to conclude, it's only three slides, this idea I started to develop, the collective redirection of a field of research. So if I think to my community, uh, um, it's complicated. I, I don't feel I'm a neuroscientist, of course, but I am in a community of, of neuroscientists. And this community uh, has uh, had this awareness of the, uh, the impact of research. So a lot of papers in, uh, in big uh, academic journals um, with various strategies to try to, uh, to limit this impact. Um, and we, we, we had this idea with, uh, with uh, two colleagues and all the neuroscience labs in Marseille. So we have a very collective project that has been funded by, uh, by Ex Marseille University. And the question is what neuroscience is possible in the Anthropocene era? Uh, We've been inspired a lot by this book, uh, Heritage and Closing, um, which explains that very synthetically that uh, it's important to, to try to de describe all the uh, um, zombies infrastructures, this is the word used, so all those technical things that are um, uh, problematic for environment, typically, and that we have to close in some situations if we want to um, continue in a, in a sustainable future. And um, our project is, is divided in three parts. Um, so the application of neuroscience to environmental crisis, so the positive aspect of neuroscience, let's say. Here this is the, the decrease of the impact of research. And this is dialectic uh, here. Um, there is a tension between those two, uh, two aspects. And at the end, uh, this is uh, the synthesis to try to, uh, to know collectively how and where we can go. And just to say that here, if you replace neuroscience by computer science, probably, uh, or information technology, um, it's, it's, it's completely uh, uh, you can translate it uh, literally. So uh, there's nothing really, uh, really specific to, to neuroscience. And uh, so I'd like to conclude on that. Um, and the fact that uh, we are now trying to develop those <coughs> reflexivity and debates in our community, trying to find moments, but institutional moments, to make all those previous questions on, to put all the previous questions on the table, okay? And uh, there is a positive aspect if we do that, uh, when you do a, a research that is impactful, you will decrease your activity. And the second positive point is that we, we can try to, to find a, a democratic solutions. So I'm relatively optimistic if everybody plays the, the game. So, and then I conclude on that, just to say that those slides are, uh, let's say, protected by this license. I want to advertise uh, um, to the advertisement for this license proposed by Eric Tanier and uh, Alexandre Monin. Um, this is a license where, when you used, uh, for instance, softwares or documents with this license, you engage to uh, use it for sustainable activities. So this is one way, for instance, one small uh, action that you can try to, uh, to, to promote uh, and tr hope that uh, other people will, uh, will use it. Thank you for your attention.